good morning it's a distinct honor and pleasure for ilbs to have two of the best liver specialists from overseas uh on behalf of the team ilbs i would like to welcome both of you here for sparing your time our first honorable speaker today is professor marcus peck who is a professor of medicine and chairman at the department of gastroenterology and hepatology endocrinology and nephrology at clinicum klagen furt austria marcus has been an outstanding investigator teacher and hepatologist par excellence and had the distinct honor of serving as the secretary general also of the easel and today we have requested him to educate us on management of infiltrative hcc marcus please uh, ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for having me here um i'm i'm coming from this place that's hard to pronounce for for non-german speakers uh but as you can see it's it's more a, a vacation place than a workplace uh, so uh, uh this is because i'm an old guy by now yeah um the the the, the topic i was given is infiltrative hcc and i was starting to think what shiv could have meant when he asked me to to talk about it you know and i was sure that that he would not give me a completely easy task uh, <laughs> and you all know him so uh i started to think what 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 would be infiltrative hcc you know it's not probably not only advanced stage hcc so it's not a universally common definition so my definition would be a tumor without clearly defined margins and potential invasion or infiltration of blood vessels and that of course could be a tumor of any stage b cell c a b c of course d also but but we're not going to talk about d because we don't have a lot of options here so 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 my assumption here uh was uh, that local regional treatment will be less effective due to early micro vascular and local invasions so we're talking about a tumor that cannot just be cured by simple intervention but you might need more than that so just to 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 show you a a picture of of one patient actually yesterday this this was one of the cases but you can see here that uh, you you do have a, a a lesion that is poorly delineated and you can easily and you don't even know what's happening here so so it's it's something that you think is is a is a is a tumor that you could control locally but there's a good chance that you can't so if we start with a uh, 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 transplant and local regional treatment uh you uh, i'm 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 showing you here one uh, uh, study that i thought was quite interesting it was a little bit difficult uh, to to comprehend for me but uh, i i'll walk you through it so so here they were looking into early transplant in 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 patients with risk factors upon resection you know that some years back the bclc algorithm changed uh, and that resection was not your number one option any longer except for when transplant would be an option for the patient and this is the study to support this uh, where you where they basically looked at patients that underwent uh, resection but were also candidates for liver transplantation and then they did subdivided the patients in the low risk group here that is patients that would not have microvascular invasion or satellites on histology and the high risk group that would have these changes uh and and these patients would then be worked up for early transplant while these patients would undergo liver transplant only upon recurrence now so when you look at the overall survival between these two groups you could see that in the beginning there were some changes but in the end uh, uh the uh, uh, outcome was was uh, uh, 
And so the overall survival was different between the two. And that's because several patients here in the high-risk group already dropped out before they could go to transplant. So uh, when you look at the high-risk patients, in, in 37 high-risk patients you had 26 recurrences, 17 were listed for early transplant, uh, because several had already recurrences before transplant, which means they had recurrence in very early on uh, due to the infiltrative HCC they were having, uh, and the median time to recurrence before transplant was 8.9 months. So, so, and that defines why you should probably have a waiting time between your treatment and actually putting the patient to transplant. And 10 patients uh, uh, from the uh, 17 patients went to transplant, and they, none of them had recurrence post-liver transplant, even though three of the 10 already had HCC foci in explant uh, uh, histology. So, so clearly, they were hitting the high-risk patients here, uh, but the outcome was still very good. And you could see the five-year oral survival in these high-risk patients transplanted early versus non-transplanted was 82% versus 38%. So, so a very clear indication that this strategy, if you bring the patients uh, to, to transplant, is good if they have this kind of high-risk infiltrative HCC. Now, when you look at the 48 low-risk patients, you also had 26 recurrences and 12 were listed for transplant. Uh, but the five-year survival for, uh, for these 48 patients, even though they had recurrences, was 90%, and there was no difference between the transplant and the non-transplant patients within these low-risk patients. So that, that shows, I think, very clearly that high-risk patients, early transplant is important. Low-risk patients is not really so important. You can wait here uh, uh, for, for, for transplant. And uh, so, so here this is the statistically significant difference in the survival curves between the transplant and non-transplant patients in the high-risk group. But when you compare the transplant patients in the high-risk early transplants versus the low-risk uh, uh, with, with transplant only on recurrence, there is no difference. So, so I think very nice picture of uh, how you could stratify your patients uh, for this kind, uh, kind of management. And then Vincenzo Mazzaferro already some years back wrote a, a very nice review on, on the adaptive approach for, for transplant listing and waiting list uh, management. And he incorporates already these criteria, morphologic criteria. And, and he says, and I think this is important, morphologic criteria for transplant should be defined a priori at the regional level, depending on waiting list dynamics, the HCC versus non-HCC patients, harm to patients on the waiting list, and, and so on. So I think this is really important. So there is not one strategy that fits everyone, but it really depends on your specific situation in your country, in your center, but you need to define it in advance how you do it. Uh, and, and these criteria should incorporate pathologic, biologic information, including biopsy or histology, AFP, uh, and the cutoffs need to be defined and treatable tumors should be treated while on the waiting list. I think this has become a, a universal paradigm by now. So here he, he, he's delineating the differences uh, between the, the, these approaches, and the, the differences are really not in the beginning uh, what in HCC beyond uh, uh, Milan criteria, uh, I should say. Basically, you have your patient, you do the staging, you do downstaging, and then you have a waiting period. As I said, this is important because you, you, you need to, to, to look for the tumor biology. You might already have, and we, in, in one of the cases yesterday, we saw that what happens if you don't do that, uh, you have early recurrence. But then the, 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 the real difference is up here, where once the patient responds to downstaging, uh, the listing really uh, is prioritized by response. Basically, patients that show a partial response get a higher priority than the patients that show a complete response. So it's not really uh, that the, you just do the listing by waiting time, but you also do the listing by tumor biology and look at these things. So uh, he, he, he also uh, supplemented this with a, with a study looking at uh, uh, downstaging, and this was a randomized trial 
uh, and this is the remarkable thing because the randomized trials on the waiting list are, are a rare occurrence, you know, because they're really hard to do. Um, but they uh, were looking at 45 patients, all of them outside Milan, 58% uh, even out of, out of up to seven, so they were really tumor, borderline tumors, uh, which, they, which they downstaged and then randomly assigned to, to, to transplantation group and uh, a control group, no transplantation here. Uh, they even allowed drug treatment while these patients were on the waiting list with sorafenib, but this, this did not change the outcome of the patients. And uh, what they found, first of all, is that tumor burden was related to the persistence of downstaging. No wonder, we would say. Uh, and uh, uh, and that, that already said. Now, the outcome you see here is very clear. Uh, even in these marginal tumors, if you do downstaging and take the ones that are successfully downstaged, the outcome is, is, is significantly better. Uh, um, uh, this is uh, tumor-free survival versus the control group. Uh, but also when you look at the overall survival, there, there's a, a, a big difference between these patients, indicating that if you take a careful approach to patients outside Milan criteria, uh, this, is, uh, uh, will, this will lead to, to good outcome. I would also uh, like to talk just a little bit about SBRT because I understood yesterday from the discussions that SBRT was something that was really practiced a lot quite here and uh, where we all think that it might be a useful uh, technique. However, there is not a great abundance of data here so far. Um, and again, I do, th I do believe that if you have a more infiltrative type of tumor, this is where you probably derive the biggest benefit from uh, such a an, neoadjuvant an treatment uh, on the waiting list. So this uh, study here fr from last year where you had 50 transplant candidates that were prospectively treated with SBRT on the liver transplant waiting list and they were retrospectively compared with other, with other treatments on the waiting list, uh, most of them TACE or, or high intensity focused ultrasound, which is, I don't know, in our country is not being done. J the Japanese are actually doing this quite a bit. Uh, uh, and what they found is that SBRT on the waiting list uh, offered significant better tumor control rate and reduced risk of waiting list dropout uh, versus these other techniques. You can see that here, a competing risk of dropout. So, so the lower line, that's the one that received SBRT while on the waiting list. Uh, and time to progression uh, 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 was also much better in the SBRT group compared to the TACE or, or HIFU groups, uh, while the post-transplant outcome was identical, but that means that the overall outcome was better in the SBRT group because you had less dropouts. You know, you always have to take this into account. Less dropouts leads to more transplants, but this does not jeopardize uh, 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 survival post-transplant. So I think a uh, very interesting uh, uh, technique. However, uh, you need to be, when you look at the real world experience, and that of course has a lot of caveats, um, here from the National Cancer Database in the US where you looked at the treatment, uh, not on the waiting list, but at, at the, the definitive treatment with RFA versus SBRT, you can see there's more than 10 times as many patients treated with RFA than with SBRT. Um, tumors up to five centimeters in diameter, retrospective propensity score matched uh, uh, analysis. Uh, you could see that the outcome with, S with RFA here, a five year survival of 30%, which is not very good to, 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 to mention, versus SBRT 19% shows you that not all the questions are solved with regards to SBRT, and, and that, of course, depends on how you select patients, and, and, and that will greatly impact the outcome. However, from these datas, data, we think that we need really prospective trials, randomized trials, in order to understand w what the uh, importance of this technique could be. Also, itchium radioembolization. Yesterday, again, a lot of talk about itchium radioembolization, and 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 the outcome for itchium radioembolization for solitary HCC is really excellent. However, even large tumors 
no vascular invasion. I think this is the key part here. And, and yesterday we saw patients with uh, portal vein invasion, hepatic vein invasion, and, and that completely changes the, the game, I would say. But if you don't have vascular invasion, you can obviously treat these large tumors very well because the, the complete response in the treated lesions was, was incredible. Yeah, uh, uh, is is almost. Uh, but this is due to uh, a selection bias and the overall uh, survival in these selected patients. Large tumor, but no vascular invasion. Again, was excellent. But you need, we need to understand that most of the patients that we see with such large tumors will not fit. And our infiltrative HCC, to come back to the topic of the talk, usually will not show these features. And likely the outcome of these patients will not be the same as for, for patients that have a well-defined 8 centimeter lesion. So the mainstay of treatment, of course, for infiltrative HCC will be drug treatments. Uh, and, and for the time being, we're still in an era where you, when you look even at the new BCLC diagram, which I will show you in the end, uh, usually has monotherapy uh, on the list, uh, but not combination therapies, while the discussion yesterday, my own practice, but obviously also the pra practice here, is oftentimes combining efforts. And, and I personally believe that this will be the way to go. However, it's not going to be totally easy to design uniform trials that will be able to show a benefit because uh, the situations are so unique. Now, uh, here, the, the ones of you that actually do HCC treatment will, will know all of this. Uh, the, the, the big game changer for, for the uh, drug treatment in HCC came in, in 2019 uh, when the uh, surprise results of the IMBRAVE 150 uh, trial were presented. And it was surprise results because we all expected the data of IMBRAVE somewhere in between 2022 and 2023. However, as it turned out, already at the first interim analysis, the data were so highly positive that the trial was ended. So therefore, nobody was waiting for these data at this point, uh, and they came as a total surprise. Now, this is the updated data. The original data showed in the, uh, uh, so the, 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 the treatment is a combination of, of an anti-angiogenic agent, bevacizumab, together with uh, atezolizumab, a PDL1 inhibitor. And the uh, original median survival uh, was estimated to be over 24 months. Now, here in the final analysis, the median overall survival was 19 months compared to the treatment with sorafenib, 13 months. And, and if you recall the original data from sorafenib in the phase three trial, the survival there was 10.7 months. So these, this sorafenib group was a good group, you know? Uh, and. Uh, and still, the survival advantage was more than six months, you know, which is incredible for, for an oncology study and was really consistent. The hazard ratio was 0.66, so th there was no doubt, and everybody was really, really excited about these data. And, and also, when you look at the uh, objective response rate of 30%, <clears throat> that was much higher than we would ever see in, in any of the TKI studies uh, uh, by RESIST 1.1 you would have a even complete responses in almost 10% of the patients. You know, this is, was unheard of for drug treatment in advanced stage HCC. And the, the ongoing response was, uh, 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 the duration of response was in median 18 months, you know, so a very long duration of response in the patients that actually responded. Now, the study that was presented this year in January at ASCO GI is the other positive trial in first-line HCC treatment. And this one is, is also interesting because it's, it's not a combination of an anti-angiogenic agent or a TKI with a pdl one inhibitor, but it's an IO-only treatment. So it's a CTLA-4 inhibitor, tremilimumab, together with a pdl one inhibitor, durvalumab, the so-called Himalaya trial. And this was also positive even though when you remember how the curves diverged in the, in the IMBRAVE study, it was not as, as, as prominent as, as it was in the, in the IMBRAVE study. 
And also the, the, the absolute difference in overall survival was 13.8 in the serafinib group, very similar to the Imbrave data, and just 16.4 months in the, in the trimalimumab plus durvalumab uh, group. Uh, but you can see very long follow-up and the curves really stay apart. So, so it's a lasting effect that you will see here. Hazard ratio was not as strong, but uh, still uh, quite good. Now what was striking in this trial is that overall survival benefit was there, but there was no benefit on, on, on progression. And this is something that uh, is still puzzling us and we are still trying to understand. I mean, if you look at the median PFS, it was actually not better than it was with sorafenib. And you, if you would look at the median time to progression, it was also not better than compared to sorafenib. Yeah? So, so this is something that still needs some expl explanation. Uh, for the time being, uh, we're just taking note of it and, and are shaking our heads. Uh, uh, Tumor response was also good, but not as good as in the Imbrave. Uh, objective response rate was not 30%, but 20%. But median duration of response, if a patient responded, was even longer. It was 18 months versus 22 months here in this study. So, so that was actually quite good. And the one thing that was really a, a positive surprise from this combination, because we have, you know, we, we have information about similar combinations in, in melanoma, where patients really suffer a lot of toxicities, hypophysitis, colitis, autoimmune hepatitis. But with this regimen, you can see that the, especially the grade three or four uh, toxicities, immune-related adverse events, were just 12%, you know, so these, these were really relatively rare occurrences, and the most common occurrence was, was actually hepatic occurrence, and the second most common was diarrhea, colitis, as, as you would expect. And these were usually able to manage quite well, and, and one of the reasons is that the CTLA-4 inhibitor in this regimen, which is called STRIDE regimen for single tremolimumab and then durvalumab extended uh, treatment, was that you only gave the CTLA-4 inhibitor once uh, as an infusion at the beginning of treatment while in the melanoma treatment, but also in the HCC trials that are ongoing, the CTLA-4 inhibitor is given four times. And it's a different type of CTLA-4 inhibitor, which could explain why you would have a lot higher rate of immune-mediated events. Um, and we're seeing it ourselves because we are part of this, uh, of this uh, study of, of, of ipilimumab and, and, and uh, uh, nivolumab. And, and it's working, but the immune-related toxicities are definitely higher. Now, subgroup analysis, our post hoc analysis, so, so what we get here is, is, uh, is just limited information. What is being discussed all the time is, is actually the outcome depending on etiology, uh, which here in the Imbrave study uh, shows of always very good response for hepatitis B associated and hepatitis C associated HCC, but not such a good response for non-viral HCC. And the question is whether this is true or whether this is not true and what it could mean. Now, what's being pointed out all the time is that in the non-viral HCC, the control group with sorafenib was doing particularly well. And, and this would be a surprise because in all the prior trials with sorafenib, it was always the hepatitis C patients that were doing especially well, in the SHARP, for example. Uh, but here, uh, uh, it could be that this lack of, uh, you know, seemingly lack of effectiveness in non-viral HCC was more due, due to the uh, uh, outcome of the sorafenib control group. Now, when we think about infiltrative HCC, so patients with uh, a macrovascular invasion or patients with extrahepatic spread, you do see that the patients that have this feature, macrovascular invasion or extrahepatic spread, this regimen works very well. So, so, so with regards to, to the task of talking about inf uh, infiltrative HCC, this seems to be a good choice for these types uh, of patients. Uh, so, and the same is true when we look at the post hoc analysis of the, of the Himalaya trial, where also patients with, with a macrovascular invasion, macrovascular invasion and extrahepatic spread all were doing well on this kind of treatment. Um, and with, with regards to etiology, it, 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 looks, it shows a different picture because here 
hepatitis B again, but also non-viral HCC seemed to be doing very well, while here the hepatitis C associated HCC was not doing so well. So as I said, this is no, no definitive proof for that. It's hypothesis generating and uh, we always point out that, our, that this should not be a major part of our reasoning what to use first in a given patient. However, of course, you cannot completely block it out when you, when you choose your drugs. Now, this is very new data, uh, uh, real world data, because all these trials were only conducted in child PUA patients. And of, obviously the question is what happens in your child PUB patients because we all know quite a few patients that we see at this disease stage are not really totally healthy. Uh, many of them will be child PUB, at least B7. And what you see here is uh, that uh, uh, the safety, this is uh, uh, very, uh, bleeding events, is not really different between child PUA and child PUB patients. Uh, most of these patients have no bleeding uh, and also the more severe grades of bleeding are, uh, are, are, are more or less the same. Uh, and uh, here is a toxicities reg uh, regarding atezolizumab, so this is immuno, uh, immune related toxicities. They're also not different between the two groups. And, and this is something that I would have expected. Uh, I mean, uh, there, there's no, no very good reason why your child PUB patients should, should have a, a safety problem uh, here with these drugs. However, when you look at the efficacy, you, you also see what you would expect. I mean, we knew already from the TKIs, from the sorafenib data, not least from my group, that the child PUB patients were living about half as long as the child PA patients were. Now, when you look at the median survival here, it's not even half, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a third uh, uh, what they live, median survival. 16.8 months in the child PA patients, so not so far from the 19 months in the phase three trial, while the median survival in child PUB was 6.7 months. And the authors interpreted is this as promising. I would interpret it as disastrous, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so I, I the, the, this Valesio was presenting this as ILC in the post around, and I was the chair, and he said it's promising, and I told him I don't see it. You know, I don't see the big promise. You can use it, but the efficacy is limited, and it's more or less the same as w what you see with all other treatments. Child PUB always is much worse than than your child PUA patients. Now this story here, I, I, I personally found particularly interesting. This is from ASCO this year, about a month old. And this is a Korean analysis that uh, uh, looked at anti-drug antibodies in atezolizumab bevacizumab combination therapy. And here you, what you do see is that they looked at these anti-drug antibodies at baseline and at cycle two, day one. And what you see here is that obviously already here in cycle two, you do have a significant number of patients that uh, show anti-drug antibodies against atezolizumab. And then when they looked at the responders, which were 21 patients versus the non-responders, 61 patients, so it's really one and three, so it's one quarter is responding, the others are not responding, then you see that most of these patients with the high levels of anti-drug antibodies in, is in the non-responder group and not in the responder group. And they went further in this analysis to look at the, at the outcome of patients with patients with low anti-drug antibodies and high anti-drug antibodies. And you could see that, the, that there was much more progressive disease, less stable disease and less, less partial response in the patients that had high levels of anti-drug antibodies versus the ones that did not. And when you looked at the progression-free survival, much better in the patients that had low levels of anti-drug antibodies uh, and that the overall survival also significantly better in patients with low anti-drug antibodies versus those with high anti-drug antibodies. Now, when you talk to Roche, which I did uh, on this occasion, they're heavily disputing that anti-drug antibodies are so important that they said it's highly complex. However, for me, these were fairly compelling data, I have to say, and, and at least you know, we, we, in gastroenterology, we do anti-drag antibodies in IBD all the time because we know that, that this is interesting and important. And, and for me, this means at least this should be looked at. And if your patient is not responding, maybe one of the reasons could be anti-drag antibodies. 
So here then the, the same study, multivariate analysis, and, and, and this was also quite good, you know. So you would see the, the, the usual suspects, eco performance status, status being highly significantly associated with outcome, AFP, microvascular invasion, and the fourth parameter were the anti-drug antibodies, and that was as strong an effect as the ECOG performance status, you know, so really fairly strong in this study. 50 patients in the test cohort, 82 patients in the validation cohorts. Not a large number, but still a good number. Uh, uh, I personally think this is interesting data. Now here, uh, uh, people, and this is from, from, from my former group uh, in, in, in Vienna, uh, and we were participating in this study, we were looking at, at potential uh, outcome parameters with uh, IO agents. And since these agents are expensive, it would be always interesting to understand before you start treatment whether you would have a good risk or a bad risk patient here. So we looked at, at potential parameters. So this was a multicenter study. We got patients from, from all over Europe, basically, uh, to include into this study. and we. Uh, looked at parameters that could be associated with outcomes in, in IO agents. And what turned out to be important parameters were, was the CRP, uh, less or more than one milligram per deciliter, and the AFP, where the cutoff was 100 nanograms per milliliters. Uh, and these two parameters, I mean, AFP, you're all aware, is a very important outcome parameter in HCC, but CRP, we had published, I think, in hepatology a few years ago that this was also a very important uh, outcome parameter with regards to TKI treatment. Uh, and CRP, even though oftentimes unrecognized in many tumors, in colorectal cancer, in many other tumors, is an important indicator of, of poor prognosis uh, uh, when, it's, when it's elevated. And elevated is already more than one milligram per deciliter. So we, we could, we could uh, uh, develop this score, simple score, where you would get zero or one point, depending on, on CRP and AFP, uh, uh, which would give you three independent groups, because patients would have either zero, one, or two points. And those were independent of child PU score and equal performance status, and would predict the outcome, the overall survival, but more importantly, it would also predict the response to tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And I think the really interesting thing about this is that it would, for tyrosine kinase inhibitor treatment, it would also predict uh, overall survival, but it would not predict response. Yeah. So, so, so for for me, I'm looking at this parameter now. If I have a, a marginal patient where I don't really know whether I should use uh, IO agents or not. Uh, because he might have some, some contraindications or at least relative contraindications. And then I see that this patient has an elevated CRP and an elevated AFP. Then I, I would rather go towards using a TKI in this patient than actually using an IO agent. Uh, you, here you can see the data in the, in the training and the validation curve. This is overall survival. And you do see that there is a significant difference between the two groups. So this is a tool that might help you to, to, to select your treatment options if you're not sure what to use. So the last part is, is adjuvant treatment after curative treatment. And again, if you got infiltrative HCC, this is probably something that uh, uh, might help you. So, so here we don't have any definitive data yet, but a lot of trials ongoing. Uh, which would be, for example, the Checkmate 9DX, uh, which is looking at nivolumab uh, uh, after resection or, or, or uh, uh, curative ablation. And the same trial is, is the Roche trial here, has this number, but it's also called Imbrave 050, which is looking at, at atezolizumab plus bevacizumab after curative resection or radiofrequency ablation in so-called high-risk patients, which means that they are actually large patients or patients if you do uh, uh, resection that have microvascular invasion. Uh, so, so we are participating in this trial here, actually, and, and, and it's interesting. Um, and, and then, of course, you have these trials that are looking into uh, the combination of uh, a local regional treatment like TACE together with uh, a durvalumab plus bevacizumab, the emerald one, and this supposedly, these data will be presented later this year, so, so we might have data from combination treatment in TACE and, and IO. 
also again uh, looking at, 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 at radiation therapy in, in narrow margin resection and your infiltrative HCC will be, might be those that have only narrow margins or, or no margins. Uh, so here patients that, that had less than one centimeter resection margin uh, in HCC were uh, treated with intensity modulated radiotherapy uh, six to, uh, four to six weeks after resection. And the outcome was really good considering these, these, this patient group because no, there was no recurrence at the resection margin. And uh, there was, of course, some intrahepatic recurrence and, and also some extrahepatic recurrence. Uh, but still, the overall survival, despite uh, this, this uh, problematic uh, situation, was 72%. Uh, so that's not bad uh, for, for this patient group. And uh, uh, the disease-free survival was, of course, different whether you had a, a microvascular invasion or not, but the overall survival was not. So here, this is, this is the last slide. Uh, this is the BCLC recommendations in the most recent update. And I'm sure the ones dealing with HCC have all read this publication and know that the, the, the more general part of the, of the algorithm up here is not very different from the, from the last uh, algorithm, except for that in intermediate stage HCC, the group that is being treated with TACE is getting smaller and smaller. So this is, this is something that we've been observing over time because TACE used to be a treatment that we would use for many patients, but with, with downstaging and better downstaging options on the, on the left-hand side and with much better uh, treatment options on the right-hand side with drug treatment, we are confining taste more and more only to the optimal patients, you know, that have a well-defined tumor. So infiltrative HCC would not be good candidates usually for, for this kind of treatment, at least not alone, maybe in combination with drugs, we will see. But those patients that have the diffuse and infiltrative uh, tumors, even though they might be intermediate stage, they should go to systemic treatment. Or if you have a large lesion, maybe a combination of a, uh, a, a treatment like, for example, uh, tear plus drug treatment. But of course, this needs to be proven because we don't have data. While the patients that can be downstage should be downstage and actually go to transplant. Now, what is new uh, here is this part down here, which is called clinical decision making, because this has not been in, in the last algorithm, but it has always been there in our minds. And it is something that we always need in our tumor boards, because Many cases are not so clear cut that they really fit one category, but, but you will have patients that, that are marginal or don't fit, but you still want to treat. And so the interesting part here is that uh, if your patients are not feasible for these curative treatments, uh, you might look into TACE, but if that's not a good uh, uh, treatment, then radioembolization for the very first time comes into the algorithm. And, and I think this is an important step. And, and it's also a deviation from the usual BCLC approach because all the other treatments, they're actually certified by prospective randomized controlled trials, while TEAR is not. However, I showed you the data from Legacy. You cannot ignore that you got a 100% response over four or five years uh, with these lesions. Uh, and if you have a 100% response, I can understand that you don't need a control group because it can't get any better, right? Um, so this is really an important part and, and, and will probably lead to much more activity here. And then with systemic treatments, at the moment it's actually a big mess. And we saw that yesterday when I presented my cases and during the discussions because, yeah, you have a clear first-line treatment, uh, uh, IO plus uh, anti-angiogenic treatment or IO, IO treatment alone. And if they're counterindicated, then maybe uh, sorafenib or lenvantinib. Uh, there's also durvalumab, but I really don't see much point in using durvalumab monotherapy. But then in the second line, of course, everything has been tested after sorafenib, but not after atezolizumab, bevacizumab. So here is more or less freestyle. And as the, if you go further down, third line, fourth line, fifth line, basically you, you will use clinical reasoning for these patients, but, but there's not really much uh, uh, that has to be done in a very, very strict way. 
So, and with that, uh, I'd like to finish. I hope, Shiv, that I was able to talk about infiltrative HCC in the way you thought I should be talking about it. Uh, and uh, I hope that I could give you at least a few new insights. I know that you're all very well educated due to the uh, continuous education that you're getting here. I, I'm always impressed. I've been many times in India now, and I, I'm always impressed by the level of knowledge that I see here. Thank you very much, and I'm open for, for questions.